Sure, sure. Yeah, it felt nice seeing you, Tung. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have time to chat after a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh... All right, so I'm ready to start. Um, okay. It's uh, just 10 o'clock um, Eastern time. Uh, good day, everybody. And thank you for coming to our Zoominar uh, series today. Uh, before I go on with the introduction, um, um, I just want to remind everybody that you will be receiving only one email about reminding uh, about the Zoominar series, and this will be on Friday evening. And our second reminder is <clears throat> that we won't be sending uh, email about the video recording. It will be. Um, if you subscribe to YouTube, you will be uh, getting emails automatically. <clears throat> and uh, to the students and postdocs, um, just we want to let you know that uh, you will be hearing uh, about uh, the format of your presentations and the times uh, sometimes in a couple of weeks. So <clears throat> I just don't want to um, so that, that's an, all the reminders, and I just want to uh, say how happy I am to introduce Professor Tong Lu. Um, Tong uh, Lu, uh, Professor Tong Lu received his bachelor's degrees in biochemistry and molecular biology at Jilin University in China, and then he went to Peking University, Beijing, to work with Professor uh, Xiao Dong Zhu. Um, after his uh, postdoctoral studies, he joined the laboratory of uh, Professor Eisenberg uh, at UCLA. This is where I uh, met him. We were together uh, in um, Professor Eisenberg's lab, and uh, he did a fantastic work on uh, studying the molecular basis of uh, amyloid uh, formation. And in uh, 2013, uh, protein, uh, Professor Tom Lu started his own lab at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Sciences in Shanghai. He continued his um, studies uh, with uh, protein uh, misfolding and aggregation, trying to understand the molecular basis. And he has been uh, extremely prolific and um, has had a lot of uh, very exciting and interesting publications. It's uh, my pleasure to um, to have you today, today um, uh, Professor Lee. So I'm just giving it to you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Matt, uh, for the nice uh, introduction. And also, I want to thank Rams for the invitation to present my work here in this wonderful Zoom there. Especially under this uh, very difficult time, we could not. Uh, I mean, talk face to face. I think this uh, online seminar is very important and for us to share our work. So my lab mainly focus on protein phase separation and amyloid aggregation, the underlying mechanism structure basis, and its relationship and all its role in neuron degenerative disease. So to, today I'm gonna. Uh, report our work on how chaperones regulate protein phase transition and protein amyloid aggregation in neuron degenerative disease. So, in the past 10 years, uh, uh, phase, uh, protein phase transition of uh, protein liquid phase separation is a very hot topic. Like, uh, the protein can self assemble into a liquid, liquid like droplets. Uh, uh, which was found to be involved in all kinds of different granules, like uh, uh, involved in biological process like DNA packing, heterochromatin remodeling, autophagy, immune activity, or pre or post nephrotermini formation. But before all of this, uh, actually, the first uh, case study of protein phase separation was. Uh, uh, well studied or is uh, intensively studied in the stress granule formation. Like uh, the researchers uh, previously found that so in Chinese disorder protein, especially RNA binding protein, they could form liquids uh, like droplets uh, involved in stress granule formation. But when this process is uh, dysregulated, uh, the 
protein can further condense into this strong amyloid aggregation related to neuron degenerative disease. So my research interest is to study the regulation in this continuous protein phase transition. What's the factors involved and how they regulate this transition. And the protein I'm interested in is this three very important RNA binding protein. TDP43, FUSE, and HNRNPA1. They are all RNA binding protein. They are normally in the nucleus involved in RNA processing. Upon stress, they can transfer to the cytosolic and condense into a stress granule to form its function. And when the stress disappears, they just get, in, get back to the nuclear. But under disease condition, when they condensed and become irreversible, they could form this amyloid or protein aggregation related, closely associated with ARS, FTD, and other neuron degenerative diseases. So they, all of this protein have a, a similar architecture. They have low complexity domain, and most of the disease mutation are located in this low complexity domain, which involved in the protein phase transition. And today I'm going to focus on this fused proteins and its role in uh, uh, ARS. So under normal condition, this RNA binding protein, as I mentioned, they can condense into stress granule, and this process is reversible. But under disease condition, it can further condense into this inverse pathological inclusions. And all of the three protein, RNA binding protein, they could uh, uh, in vitro, by, by themselves, they could spontaneously form this highly dynamic liquid-like droplets. And uh, this state can spontaneously undergo fit transition to form, to, to undergo this liquid to solid fit transition and uh, form this uh, amyloid fibrolar-like structure. And this state is closely related to the disease. And um, as I mentioned, my research interest uh, in re, uh, research interest, uh, one of the major research interests is to study the structure basis of this reversible phase transition and also this irreversible phase transition. This is the first direction. And the second one is uh, the how the post-translational modification or disease mutation regulate uh, this process, this phase transition. The, the third one is uh, the regulators like the chaperone, RNA or, or metabolites, how this regulators can regulate the phase transition. And today I'm gonna show you our work on how the chaperone is involved in this phase transition, the different continuous phase transition. As we know that for the stress granules, in addition to all of the different RNA binding protein, there are lots of RNA and other proteins involved in the stress granule formation. The mass spec study show that a lot of like several hundreds of different proteins are involved in this stress granule formation. And very interestingly, a lot of them are chaperones like HSP60, HSP70, 19, and others. So indica it's indicate that the chaperone may play an important role in this, this phase transition and the stress granule formation. There are a lot of studies showing that a different chaperone can build a chaperoning network in cells like to help protein folding and so to reverse protein aggregation to dissolve protein by HSP100 and upon stress, the small hedgehog protein kick in its expression increase and uh, can prevent protein aggregation. But for the stress, uh, for, for the phase separated state, uh, very limited study were uh, do are done to study how chaperones can modulate uh, the granule formation of protein in phase separated states. Uh, actually, a 2019 four cell paper identified the first uh, non canonical chaperone called type 2 b 2 is uh, important. Uh, the fir it's first time showing that uh, this uh, cap 2 uh, a cap b 2 can inhibit fuse phase transition. So it can 
bind to fields and prevent it uh, from liquid-liquid separation as well as uh, fiber formation. So this is uh, the first case showing that uh, a chaperone may be involved in uh, phase transition. And uh, in this case, the results uh, show that the protein can efficiently prevent phase transition of fields. So in my study, we are interested in the chaperone, the clinical chaperone identified in the stress granule and how they behave when involved in the, uh, regulating protein phase transition, especially the fields in, in, in granule. The first I'm gonna show you is the, the small heat shock protein here, HSPB1, also called HSP27. Uh, so each small heat shock protein, they have this, 10 different uh, subfamily, HSP1 all the way to P10. So three of them, B1, B5, and B8, so they are ubiquitous uh, expressed, and uh, these three are uh, highly express, uh, uh, expressed in brain and involved in neurodegenerative, uh, neurological diseases. So small HR protein, the response to stress, like heat stress or other stress, it can prevent the protein from like misfolding or other bad things. And uh, HSP27, the small heat shock protein was identified in the stress granule and is closely related to ARS. So in ARS patients, mutation in HSP27 promoter were identified. Also, or express of HSP27 can prevent uh, spinal motor neuron from degeneration. So it uh, can inhibit uh, neuron toxicity of fields and also it can co-localize with uh, fields and SOT1 in the stress granule, indicating that the HSP27 may play an important role in modulating RNA binding protein like fuels for its phase separation. So the key question I want to ask in this first part is whether HSP27 can directly modulate the phase transition of fuels and the structure basis underlying. And the, 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 the third one is whether this process is under regulation and what's the mechanism. So first, uh, we check if HSP27 can prevent uh, fuel space separation in cells. So from here, we can clearly see that the knockout of uh, HSP27, it's, uh, it's increased, dramatic increase uh, uh, transition of uh, fuels. But when you ever express HSP27, it can efficiently prevent the fuel phase uh, transition and recruit into the stress granule. An in vitro study also showed that the pure HSP27 can efficiently prevent the field phase transition. And as a, a control, the other small heat shock protein, HSPB5, as I just mentioned, is very similar to uh, uh, 27, but in a different uh, uh, subfamily, it showed no effect in field phase transition, showing that HSP27 is uh, kind of specific uh, to target and prevent field surface transition. And next, we want to know how it, uh, HSP27 uh, interacts uh, with the fields. The fields has two uh, low complexity domain, the N-terminal LC domain and the C-terminal RGG region. The first, we check if HSP27 can interact uh, with uh, the CTD RGG region. So the study showed that, the results show that uh, uh, HSP27 didn't uh, influence the phase transition or very mildly modulate the phase transition of uh, fuels CTD. But uh, for fuels uh, uh, NTD, low capacity domain, it can very efficiently prevent or block phase transition of this uh, LC domain. As a control, the other small H operating RB crystalline issue no effect in the phase transition of the uh, uh, RC domain of fields. So HSP27 is very efficiently prevented. And uh, more interestingly, it can reverse phase separated uh, 
fuse LC is when it forms a straw plate, uh, when you add the HSP27, it can reverse it to dissolve the phase transition. This is the control showing no effect of the other small Hitchhoff proteins. And next, we want to know how HSP27 recognizes uh, which residue or which if it recognizes uh, specific uh, region or particular regions of uh, fused LC. So we did an MR experiment, titration experiment. This showed that uh, we titrate HSP27 to the N15 labeled fused LC and show the overall the intensity and chemical shift of uh, the residue in LC drops or chemical shift, showing that uh, HSP27 can weakly bind to multiple regions, but not specific particular region of fused LC. But when we regroup, uh, we, we check the residue tab, we saw the serine shows the uh, most significant uh, chemical shift, uh, indicating that HSP27 may pre Virtually interact with the serine, in uh, which distributed uh, like uh, amylase in the fused LC domain. So it can weakly interact with uh, fused LC and prevent uh, it to interact to form phase transition. And next, we want to know which region or which domain HSP27 used to interact with the fused LC. We did. Uh, several different constructs and it's very interesting showing that uh, this uh, client binding motif of small hair, well studied uh, client binding motif of small hair shock protein, it showed just uh, no effect in uh, fields phase transition and also the CTD show nothing but when, only when we connect, uh, when we add the NTD region, it starts show some activity. So the dirt CTD, only the dirt CTD shows some effect, but it's much weaker than the, the, the wild type. Without the CTD, this, this, this construct is not, a, it's, it's low molecule weight oligomer. So with this CTD can mediate high molecule weight uh, oligomer formation. So next, we just swap, we want to study if the C N terminal is very important, uh, is uh, crucial in mediating HSP for uh, 24, uh, 27 phase uh, effect. So we swapped the N terminal uh, NTD of HSP 27 to RB crystalline. The control I just mentioned show no effect. So when we swap uh, the NTD to RB crystalline, it starts to show very efficient. Uh, inhibition effect. And uh, with uh, the RFB crystalline NTD, HSP27 just lost entirely, lost its activity in inhibiting uh, fields LC phase, uh, phase transition. So this clearly shows that uh, HSP27 utilize its N-terminal in its oligomeric state to interact with uh, fields. So this is a demonstrate showing that uh, uh, HSP27, it can form this multimeric high oligomer uh, multimer state and it uses NTD to interact with uh, the fields LC and prevent it from droplet formation. But uh, from here, it's, uh, it's just uh, more or less like the uh, 2018 cell paper showing that, uh, okay, another sharp from HSP, small H sharp protein can recognize the fields and prevent it from uh, phase transition. But, uh, so th this, this two protein can prevent it from phase transition, but under stress condition, as we know that the fields need to undergo phase transition and enter a stress granule to fulfill its uh, function. And under disease condition, if this regulation dysregulated, it's dysregulated, it just further form this amyloid aggregation related to disease. So we want, uh, very interesting, HSP27 upon stress, uh, it can be phosphorylated at the N terminal and uh, it can dis dissociate from high molecule weight oligomer to low 
molecule weight oligomer. So the state on the HSP27 changed. So we want to dig more, dig further to see if the stress can, I mean, fine tune the activity of HSP27 for chaperoning fields, LC phase transition. So uh, we mimic uh, uh, phosphorylated uh, HSP27. Uh, this is uh, well known that upon stress, uh, this three site was phosphorylated. And uh, we just uh, did uh, the 3D mutation to mimic that. Uh, so, so it showed that when it's uh, phosphorylated, uh, normally it's a high molecule weight uh, oligomer, so it's uh, disassembled to low or a molecule volume. Very, very interestingly, when it's first related, the 3D construct uh, is uh, severely lost uh, its inhibition effect uh, against the uh, field's LC formation. Like uh, for wild type, it can very efficiently prevent uh, field speech transition. But uh, when we did the 3D mutation, so the inhibition effect uh, just totally lost in the low ratio, molar ratio. So, this is a very interesting observation. And uh, more interestingly, when it's the inhibitory effect lost, uh, it can, HSP27 3D can co phase separate uh, with field LC. So they can co phase separate to form the granular like structure in the draw plate. And as I mentioned, the field LC by itself, it can first form this. Uh, highly dynamic draw plate, liquid-like draw plate, but upon time, it just spontaneously forms this uh, solid-like, fibular-like, the urchin-like structure. So we call this maturation and amino aggregation. But upon incub co-incubate with this uh, 3D HSP27, it can maintain or stabilize the HSP uh, uh, field LC in this highly dynamic draw plate state. So from a uh, FRAP experiment, we can say that uh, uh, feels by itself uh, 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 after 20 minutes, uh, say the, 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 the dynamic, droplet dynamic decreased dramatically, but in the presence of HSP27 co-phase separated, uh, the, the dynamic still keep uh, very good. So, which means that uh, when co-phase separated with uh, fields LC, HSP27 can sharp running Chaperon fields in phase separate state to keep it as a very dynamic and functional state. So this is very interesting. We, we think it's very interesting observation that uh, for the HSP27 and the normal condition, it's bind to uh, fields, recognized fields by its N terminal and uh, prevent it from phase separate transition. But upon stress, fields need to get into stress granules. So in this case, the HSP27 was phosphorylated and disassembled into this state and co-phase separated in the stress granule, prevented from, uh, from further aggregation. So we next check, uh, indeed, uh, HSP27 is very efficient in prevent fields amyloid aggregation. And upon phosphorylated 3D uh, strand, the Fiber formation inhibition effect is dramatic increase, which is consistent with this transition things. And the cell cellular experiment also confirmed that uh, when we introduce P this uh, disease mutation fields, uh, we can see that uh, when or express HSP27, the phosphorylated 27 increase and it's dramatically inhibits uh, the amyloid aggregation of this disease mutation of fields. And uh, in the end, we want to know which region of HSP27 is involved in preventing fused fiber formation. Is it the same as uh, uh, for recognizing fused uh, uh, liquid phase transition? So we did all of the different constructs. And very interesting that uh, unlike uh, the region, the N terminal, which recognizes the fields for preventing its phase transition. In this case, it just uses AC, ACD, the alpha crystalline domain, to prevent the fiber formation. So, this domain is more efficient in preventing the fields phase transition. So, and uh, we did an MRI titration experiment showing that uh, 
for this core ACB core region, it just uses bit five, six, seven, this patch to interact with fields and prevent to prevent its fiber formation. So by its MR experiment. So as a summary for the first part, we show that HSP 27, it can assemble into high order multimer under normal conditions. So this state, it can interact with the fields LCD by uh, 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 CTD by multivalent weak interaction and keep it from phase separation. Upon stress, this uh, partially disassembled and uh, then it can co phase separate with fields into the stress granule. And more importantly, by co phase separate with the fields, it further prevents fields from fiber formation by using its uh, 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 alpha crystalline domain. So this this like to sharp rounding fields in the phase separated states. So that's the first uh, case. The second case, uh, I think I have uh, uh, I have 15 minutes more. So I uh, I will show you my second. Uh, uh, case the sharp prongs, the an another sharp prongs identifying stress granule. So in this case, it's the HSP40. So the HSP40 was also found in stress granule, and is there are many evidence showing that this protein is the all sharper, it's also involved in the ARS or ARS related RNA binding protein aggregation. So HSP40 can is exists in East, what was found to, to exist in East stress granule and also uh, HSP40 can very efficiently inhibit the cytotoxicity of uh, fuels H uh, TDP43 and it can prevent uh, cytotoxicity of this RNA binding protein showing that it may play an important, uh, potentially important role in modulating this RNA protein phase transition. So in this case, we want to ask first, how HSP40 behavior in vitro and in cells and whether and how HSP40 modulate phase transition of fields and that, uh, the, the third one is what's the structure basis? So very interesting, unlike HSP27, uh, HSP27 is very stable, it's just uh, keep uh, soluble in solution, but for HSP40, very interesting, when we put it in the solution under low salt, it's, got, it's just spontaneously undergo phase transition, it's from this droplet-like structure. When we in increase the salt concentration, it's just uh, go back into a clear solution and the droplet is highly dynamic from the FRAP experiment. So this is very interesting. A sharp from by itself can undergo phase transition. So this is a very interesting thing. And then we study exam the endogenous uh, HSP40. This is uh, HDG1. This is uh, the HSP40 proteins. And we found that uh, indeed uh, it's localized in nucleus and it can form this punct or granule-like structure. When we close them with uh, other known uh, granule, uh, nuclear granule like Kaho or Paraspaco, it doesn't uh, co localize with either of them, but uh, it's uh, ubiquitin rich, the nuclear body. So uh, HSP40 is in the nucleus and uh, can form this granule enriched in the UB. We think it's, it's maybe involved in protein quality control or ubiquitin related protein quality control. And very interesting, upon stress, we saw that uh, uh, endogenous HSP40 can be enriched uh, from, from nuclear to the cytoplasma. It's uh, get into the stress granule. So this is a very interesting 40. So upon stress, it can it get into the stress granule, showing that indeed 40 HSP40 undergo phase separation involved in stress granule formation. So next we First, want to know which region mediates uh, HSP40 phase transition. So this is domain organization. We did uh, a series of uh, construct. Uh, uh, we delayed uh, like the DD domain and also NTD. It's very interesting. Like uh, in the NTD, it has uh, this in Chinese order region, the G, 
GF rich region, and also it has uh, ar multiple arginine, beta arginine. So we show from this construct, uh, we found that uh, both DD and also this GF Lincoln region is very important in phase transition. When you delete this GF region or the entire NTD region, it's just totally abolish the phase transition of HSP40. So next, we focus on this multiple arginine and phenyl arginine region. We did the sequential mutation to arginine and showing that indeed this phenyl arginine and arginine are very important. We mutated it, all mutated to arginine, it's just totally abolished phase transition of HSP40. And also cell, cellular study also show that when we mutate it to arginine, so it's uh, most of the HSP40, they just uh, don't uh, get into stress granule upon stress. So showing that uh, this region is very important, uh, multiple arginine and phenylalanine region mediating HSP40 phase transition. So the next question we want to ask how HSP40 regulates uh, phase transition of fields in stress granule. And uh, when we co-incubate uh, HSP40 and uh, fields, uh, we found that uh, interestingly, they can co phase separate the condensed into the droplet. And also in cells, we could see that uh, upon stress, the HSP40 and uh, fields, they co phase separate, uh, co localize in the stress granule. And the next, we want to know which region or what, what uh, residues involved in this interaction between the HSP40 and the fields. So the first is the fuels LC domain. We saw that uh, HSP40 and the fuels LC can co phase separate and synergistically uh, they pro promote the phase transition of these two proteins. And uh, they are highly dynamic protein, uh, protein uh, 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 droplets. Then we did an MR experiment. Uh, again, they show that uh, uh, HSP40 can interact uh, with uh, multiple so a residue, different residues along the LC domain. It doesn't have particular region or particular residue to interact. So it's just weakly interact with the multiple residues in the field's LC. And then we did a different kind of mutation or truncation showing that in this case, the arginine, multiple arginine within that uh, GF region, in trend disorder region, is uh, most uh, severely, I mean, this uh, impairs uh, its uh, 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 co phase separation between the 40 and the fields, everything. And uh, next, uh, we passed uh, exam the C term, CTD, RGG regions. And uh, we saw similar to NTD region, RGG region can also, uh, RGG region of fields can also co phase separate uh, uh, with HSP40. And uh, for all of this uh, different mutation, we find that uh, unlike uh, the NT NTD, which R is very crucial, in this case for the CTD, HSP40, its use is phenylalanine, multiple phenylalanine to mediate its interaction. When we mutate the phenylalanine to alanine, it's uh, impair the co phase separation. Things. And uh, so that's uh, the mechanistic study. The next, we want to know what co phase separation of HSP40 with fields. So what's the function of this? So as, the similar as HSP27 studies, fields by itself, is form this droplet and upon maturation, the fibrous structure will grow from this droplet and spontaneous form undergo this uh, liquid to solid phase transition. But when we co-incubate uh, co uh, with the HSV40, it can stabilize the fields in this highly dynamic phase separation state. So the FRAP experiment also show that uh, in the presence of HSV40, the droplet is highly dynamic and uh, this fibrillar aggregation state uh, was pre efficiently prevented. And uh, next we did uh, uh, THT fiber formation assay also show that uh, HSV40 can very efficiently prevent the fused LC amyloid aggregation. And uh, 
we test a different construct to see which region or which domain is the most important and showing that uh, very interesting that uh, in this case to prevent uh, fields fiber formation it use another region it uses uh, CTD the client binding region so this region is uh, shows more most significant uh, inhibition effect so as a summary in this part uh, we first show that uh, this is a HSP40. It can spontaneously form phase, trans uh, phase transition by itself. And uh, the NTD, especially the arginine and the fen phenylalanine in the NTD, the GF region is very important in mediating HSP40 phase transition. Also, the DD dimerization domain is also involved in phase transition. And for the fields, uh, it can co phase separate with HSP40. And very interestingly, 40 use different uh, module or residue to interact with different regional fields. For the fields uh, RC, NTD, HSP40 normally uh, dominantly use its arginine to interact. It, it makes sense because for RC domain, it uh, is highly enriched in the phenylalanine or aromatic residue. So arginine can form pi chitin interaction with the, the RC to interact with it and the co-phase separate. And for the field CTD, which is enriched in RGG rich motif, in this case, the HSP40, it uses multiple phenylalanine to form this pi chitin interaction and interact with the co-phase separate with the CTD. And uh, when it's co-phase separated with the uh, fields, uh, interact with the, uh, the fields and uh, to perform for four is a, a different uh, uh, function. So as a summary of uh, this part, uh, we found that HSP40, it can undergo free transition. I mean, under normal condition, it just uh, can form this granule-like structure in nucleus. Upon stress, it can get into the stress granule and stabilize the fields and other RNA binding proteins. Co-phase separate, uh, chaperoning phase separation state in the granule and uh, make it maintain its uh, physiological function, prevent its amyloid aggregation. So under like aging or mutation, disease mutation, when this balance was disrupted, may the uh, fields and other protein may further uh, form amyloid aggregation and uh, deposit in your degenerative disease. So, which is a functional state, and then all the way to the pathological inverse amyloid state. So we focus on regulation of this complicated phase transition. And in this case, we show the first case, HSP27, the small HR protein, it can prevent the phase transition of fields to stabilize it in the dispersed state. But upon stress, it has very interesting regulation mechanism is phosphorylated HSP27 can get into the stress granule co phase separated with fuels and prevent it from phase transition. And in another case, we show that HSP40 by itself, it can undergo phase transition and the co phase separates with fuels and stabilizes stabilize it uh, in the phase separate state, preventing it from phase transition. transition. So different chaperone may use different mechanism and different uh, domain to interact uh, with RNA binding protein, like to stabilize it e either in the uh, soluble or polydispersed uh, state or in the phase separated uh, functional state. So that's uh, uh, my presentation and uh, the acknowledgement uh, 
th this two work was done by my grad students, uh, Jing Ge and Zheng Ying, and also Dr. Sheng Nan. This is my group. I want to thank everyone. And also my collaborator, uh, Dr. Dan Li and uh, Liu Zhijun, and uh, the funding support. And uh, with that, I want to uh, close and thank all. I would like to take a question. So thanks. Mm. Hi, Tom. Thank yes. you so much. It was such an exciting talk. So, Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, like we, I really learned a lot uh, about that. So let's see uh, if uh, we have anybody from um, the audience who we can allow. Yes, Hello? Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just seeing that we have, uh, we just, uh, uh, Long Chang, who wants to ask a question. Yes. Hi, Song. Hi, nice to meet you. I think the last time we meet here, Arthur is Barcelona. Yeah, oh, that's a fantastic you. talk. Awesome. Uh, here, I have two questions. Is, uh, we know that this uh, fuels or TDP for soy or any pathological protein in the neurodegenerative disease also undergoes uh, PTM. So my question yes. is, ever look at what's your thought about the PTM of fuse or TDP43, this kind of uh, protein, uh, how the fact interaction with the shaflon and uh, the other pathological protein? So that's the first question. The second question is, do you ever test uh, uh, droplet independent, like a phase uh, separation independent uh, fibro? For example, the fibro, you isolate it from the human patient disease brain, mm -hmm. or uh, directly use the monomer to do the fibrillation. Uh, in mm -hmm. uh, the, my question is, uh, do you, what, is there any differences between this, uh, uh, you know, the directly fibro, you isolate a human patient? And also the, the last question is, the recent nature paper show uh, mm -hmm. HSP, 70 and 40 in the alpha synuclein fibril, yes. mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, uh, the aggregation. But uh, you know, the model is in the disease condition, the uh, it looks like a law function. So my question is uh, how you understand in the disease of the fibril formation, and uh, you see the HSP, but it cannot rescue the fibril. It looks like it's a law function for HSP. Uh, what's your thought about this uh, situation? Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, th thanks for the question. I think they are all very good questions. So, uh, for the first uh, question, you, you mentioned the PTM in uh, fields RTD43. There are any of them, and uh, yeah. are they uh, influence uh, uh, the chaperon protein yeah. interaction or the aggregation of this uh, RNA binding yeah. protein? I, yeah. I just saw the paper from your lab in the uh, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a fantastic work about uh, the PTM yeah. mapping on the top. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think definitely the PTM is very important. It's mm -hmm. uh, widely observed in amyloid protein. And yeah. I, I recently I, I wrote a review paper for NCB. Uh, highlighting the PTM and also cofactor in regulating protein amyloid aggregation, especially mm -hmm. like tau, like arsenicline and other protein, they all they are all observed to be widely uh, phosphorylated, uh, phosphorylated mm -hmm. or ubiquinated on other things, right? And also from the structure biology view, we just uh, published a, a paper on PNS showing that the PY. 39 phosphorylation on Y39 in RFC nucleus can totally rearrange the RFC in fiber formation, rearrange yeah. the fiber structure. So I think um, phosphorylation or PTM is very important. And yeah. for fields, TDP43, also many phosphorylation sites or uh, ubiquitin nation, methylation and uh, paralation sites were identified. And we indeed, we, we, we studied, we investigated some of them. Last year, we published a cell research paper showing that uh, uh, like paralation uh, of HNRNPA1 and also TDP43 can promote uh, RNA binding protein phase transition and also 
to facilitate the fiber formation. Yeah. So I think, uh, but uh, we 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 have we haven't yet identified particular PTM sites to interfere RNA binding protein and chaperone. But I think uh, there should be some case like uh, phosphorylation or some other PTM in fields or HRNPA1, which can disrupt the chaperone and protein interaction and then may promote uh, pathological amyloid aggregation of fields. So that's question, yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. the first. Also, time to issue you to answer this question from, then we can uh, contact by email because I think it saves some time for other, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the second one, could you, could you remind me? The fibro. Do you ever try the fibro isolated from like a human patient tissue and to look at how the shaft work on this uh, droplet dependent? Pathology. Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, from our experiment, uh, mm. we show that uh, fiber can be formed either mm. by uh, directly from monomeric species or from a droplet. I think both uh, uh, mm. step, uh, both case, uh, I think they can form fiber. So liquid phase transition is not necessary for fiber formation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also in patient brain, when we saw the aggregates, we we have no strong or I mean mm. e efficient evidence showing that that aggregate is directly from the droplet or granules. So, so it's yeah. uh, still controversial in this case. Mm. But uh, in our case, we show in vitro that it's a continuous process. So fiber indeed can grow from the droplet, and uh, we show that. Uh, when you add uh, uh, chaperone, it can co phase separate and stabilize the protein in the phase separate state and prevent it from viral formation. But under disease condition, I think we cannot rule out that uh, maybe the like a fields or TDP43, they can form amino pathological amino fiber directly from the uh, monomeric or the polydispersed uh, state. But in yeah. that case, like HSP27, it can still target, bind to uh, the, the field's protein and prevent it uh, to directly find, yeah. uh, form amyloid aggregation. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, but the third one is uh, HSP4070 uh, interact on RFC nuclei, right? So it's a back-to-back -back nature paper just uh, came out. So that's very interesting work, actually, yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, also, uh, we, we, we're also interested in, it's, it's very interesting, uh, actually last year we published a paper showing that uh, different chaperone can recognize different region of RFC nuclein, you know, mm. we, yeah. we show that small h protein can uh, target like the N terminal of RFC and uh, HSP40 can target the C terminal, so it can synergistically, I mean, interact with uh, RFC nuclein and uh, prevent it from uh, amyloid aggregation. I think yeah. I think definitely chaperone is very important in maintaining RFC tau or other proteins, either I mean in polydispersed state or phase separated state. Uh, prevent uh, normally they just they prevent uh, protein from amyloid aggregation and uh, also like for HSP one hundred, uh, that case it can reverse or disassemble preformed amyloid uh, aggregation of our and others. Yeah, thank you so much for the answer. Sure, sure. Thank thanks, you. Thanks for asking. Uh, sure. uh, hi, Bikush, do you mind letting uh, Wang in uh, to ask questions? I just cannot figure out. Uh, sure, sure. Oh, yeah, so uh, oh, the next one is Bina. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, both are on the queue, Magda. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just saw them. Hi, hi. That hi, was a hi. very interesting talk. Uh, I thank have you. a couple of quick questions. Um, sure. So when the conditions uh, return back to normal, then how do you go back to, you know, these proteins coming out of the stress granules? Because one of them, um, you mentioned the HSP27 is a... Um, has a PTM and then that directs this, uh, you know, co-formation of this stress cannula. So I was just wondering, how would it disassociate when the normal conditions 
you know, back. Yeah, yes, okay, fair enough. So that, that's your question, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting, it's, very, yeah, it's a good question. So actually, as I, I, as I show that uh, in the stress granule, there are like over 100 different protein involved in granule formation and uh, HSP27 is one of them. I think it's a very important one, but uh, for the, like the stress granule dissociation, we think uh, more protein may be recruited or kicked in to interact or to, 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 to help to de disassemble the protein. You know, like uh, uh, the, the other ATP triggered uh, protein and also if the granule dynamic is uh, impaired, uh, we are working, actually we, we, we have one ongoing project showing that different protein can be recruit into a stress granule in different uh, uh, states. Like for the very beginning, like HSP40 may be involved. And when the stress prolonged, HSP19 can uh, sequentially be recruited into the granule. And then mm -hmm. if the granule need to be dissociated or be degraded, maybe, uh, chip or E3 proteins or more autophagy pathway the player may be involved and uh, then put uh, HR part. So other protein, okay. I think my, my, my answer is um, HSP40 or HSP27, uh, we think is uh, very important in maybe the first uh, or initial state of uh, granule formation. And uh, in the following state, uh, other part or other player may be involved and uh, play an important role in the reverse this phase transition. And also, I mean, for the normal condition, uh, when, when the stre uh, stress comes, uh, HSP27 was phosphorylated, uh, but when the stress disappeared, uh, then HSP 27 was dephosphorylated. So HSP27 gain its inhibitory activity. So it can help to put uh, fields apart so to prevent it uh, from uh, phase transition. But I think other protein may be also very important in, in the dis disassembly of stress granule formation. It's not uh, like uh, in stress granule, only HSP27 or HSP40, these two protein are involved. I think more and more protein are kicking, will be kicking in. Right, so that, that's what I was wondering. Have you tried an experiment in your in vivo experiment wherein you have both uh, HSP27 and HDJ1? And then you see which of them will, you know, preferentially drag. Because as you mentioned in the stress granule, there are so many of the proteins, right? So, uh, right. I mean, have you tried that kind of an experiment and see uh, the preferential binding and if they uh, work together uh, or one has yeah, a higher yeah, affinity? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Uh, you, you mean if uh, they synergistically or one of them pre preferentially binds to fields and uh, may put it into stress granule and uh, keep its uh, state in stress granule. Well, we, we didn't do that. Uh, the thing we did is we, I mean, for HSP27 study, we always press it or knock down, knock out that to see if it uh, uh, inference or effect uh, fields with transition or stress granule formation and uh, the same as uh, HSP. Uh, 40. But I think that's a, that's a good point. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, to combine more and more proteins uh, in uh, stress gland to study their interplay or their preferential behavior to particular proteins. I mean, in this case, we just use fields as the model system because fields is very important. Uh, the dysregulation of fields uh, can induce its amyloid aggregation related to neurodegenerative disease. But uh, I believe that uh, these two proteins are not, fields is not uh, the 
only client protein for mm. these two chaperones. There are a lot more protein, like TDP43 or HRP or other proteins. So mm -hmm. I think definitely each chaperone, a particular chaperone, it should have its preferential, I mean, client pattern or a group of client proteins. And I think that will be a very interesting thing to study. I mean, you can. In, in one side, the list uh, a couple of uh, client protein, and the other side, the different chaperone to see if uh, they have a uh, client chaperone binding specificity in the space separated state, and how they synergistically interact uh, in the stress granule to keep the, the homeostasis in the stress granule. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi Wang, it's your turn. Can you unmute? Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Wang from Michigan, uh, work on Zagology. So the reason I'm, uh, I'm interested in the phys physiological function of this phase separation. So mm -hmm. I work on the Zagology and there's a set of proteins form trans oligomers. There's mm -hmm. those proteins called the gross proteins. It's highly ordered, the uh, N terminus, highly disordered or intrinsic disorders, C terminus. Mm -hmm. I cannot figure, I have evidence it form liquid phase separation, but I cannot figure out what the, uh, you know, uh, the function okay. is. So in terms of your work, mm -hmm. let's, let me ask, say, okay, you know, you show that HSP 40 or 27 have mm -hmm. fuse or TDP 43 form liquid phase. So to mm -hmm. me, the liquid phase separation may impact two things. One is interaction with mRNA or some other function. The other one is right. change the dynamic between this, I, I call this liquid phase separation as a, fun, as a soluble functional or nature. And mm -hmm. then the inclusion body as uh, you know, precipitate or you know, the, the toxic mm -hmm. stuff. So in terms of these two things, what do you see with or without phase separation or with or without the co-separation with chaperones? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think uh, your question is in general, uh, what's the function of uh, phase separated uh, states or when protein forms this granule-like structure, uh, what's the function or why is it form this granule, right? Yeah, right. So, so also, like in your case, you find a protein which can undergo phase separation in Gorgi, but you don't know why it should form. That's so right. in yeah. general, when protein, uh, I mean, in my opinion, we have a screening assay showing that uh, in general, all of a protein can phase separate, can form a liquid-like droplet. It's like a crystallization. I, I used to be a, a structure biologist, you know, a, a crystallographer. So the Chris, uh, protein Chris, uh, crystallization is a kind of uh, phase uh, separation or phase transition. So we develop a assay, high through protein assay, and we check a lot of different protein, and we found that most of them can form liquid phase separation, can undergo phase transition. So we think that the phase transition is an intrinsic property shared by different protein. But uh, why protein? need to undergo phase transition. Like in stress granule case, uh, we think that when it needs to pr protect uh, like mRNA or other protein upon stress. So upon stress is just recruit uh, mRNA or other proteins and put it into like the granule-like state to protect them. And uh, uh, when the stress disappears, it just disassemble, dissociate to fulfill its uh, normal function. But if it's under, uh, it, it's, it's dysregulated, uh, like uh, the fields or HRMP A1 in the stress granule can further condense uh, to undergo phase transition to form this pathological amyloid fiber like structure. So if this uh, reversible phase transition, is underregulated, uh, dysregulated, it can cause disease. But in other cases, 
the stress granule is one case for explaining the function of phase transition, protein phase transition. But for other systems, there are so far there are different uh, systems, phase transition system performing different uh, biological processes. Like uh, uh, last uh, month, we we published a paper showing that the uh, shake two, the phosphor phosphatase, one phosphatase, it can undergo phase transition. So well, why it's for it need to form phase transition? So it can recruit its uh, substrate or downstream regulatory proteins. And so they can condense to increase local concentration of the binding partner along the signal pathway to amplify the signal pathway, you know. So they just use this phase separation state to amplify to for the tra signal transduction. And uh, this, this is another case. Like for the enzyme, when it's Phase separate, like the several enzyme, when they co phase separate, this state can boost its overall enzymatic activity, like for the compound or metabolite production things. And in another case, like for the heterochromatin remodeling, a lot of st recent studies show that the protein like H HP1 it can mediate uh, heterochromatin remodeling by phase separation or like the gene transcription things uh, there are phase transition so in that case uh, phase transition may recruit different uh, proteins together to adjust uh, or to I mean to to modulate uh, the structure or the state uh, condensation state of heterochromatin so in that case or it can boost or regulate uh, the gene trans, trans, transcription. So protein can, different protein can condense undergo phase separation to form different kind of stress, a, a granule like structure, membranous compartments. And uh, each individual co compartment uh, or phase separated uh, states, uh, I think they may fulfill, uh, fulfill different uh, biological functions. So I don't know if I answer your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Sean, that was a great talk. Can I ask a question? Thanks, Ram. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, in your HSP inhibition or FUS uh, phase separation and fiber formation, you showed that the N-terminus is very important. And then the oligomeric, uh, oligomer seems to be the most crucial species yeah. of HSP in this process. Um, very naive question is that, um, mm -hmm. do you know the size and stability of these oligomers? Which one will be more effective and, and why? Uh, is there, are there any other biological relevance for the, the formation of oligomers of HSP? Yeah, that's, that's great. yeah Ram, so that's a great question. So uh, it's, it's very interesting, like the small HSP protein, HSP27, and uh, also the other RFB crystalline, they can just self-assemble to form high-order multimer. Actually, a study trying to figure out uh, the accurate molecular weight of multimer, like uh, 20 years ago, there are a lot of uh, work going to study, but uh, it showed that uh, it doesn't form uh, like a particular, like uh, 40 more or 30 more, they can form uh, very heterogeneous multimer, ranging from, I think, uh, 20 mer to 48 mer, something like that. So mass spectrometry study showed that. So it's just a form of full spectrum of uh, heterogeneous high order multimer for HSP24. Yeah, uh, yeah, are there any um, role for the structure in the stability and the distribution of this oligomer? Uh, yes, I, actually they, they study that showing that the, let me, uh, here, the CTD mm. is involved in the multimer formation. So it mediates, it's, it, it's kind of uh, mediates uh, the intermolecular interaction between the HSV27 uh, in the multimer and also NTD. It's, 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 it's kind of controversial, you know, uh, because uh, no, atomic structure of the multimer was determined. So most of them are indirect uh, evidence showing okay. both. The CTD definitely is involved in multimer formation. And also some studies show the NTD is involved, is important in multimer formation, but the others they show 
is not that uh, crucial. But uh, uh, phosphorylation of NTD is very interesting. Phosphorylation, the 3D mutation, is, a lot of studies show that it can disrupt uh, the multimer. It can, uh, let me show this. Here, see yep. the, the well type, uh, it's just from high molecule weight oligomer, it's heterogeneous. But when you mutate it uh, to 3D, then it's from this uh, lower, much lower oligomers. So in this case, we, we think the NTD is also involved in multimer formations. And uh, when you mutate it and phosphorylate it, it's just disrupt the interaction between the NTD from different uh, molecules and uh, disrupts its interaction. And uh, we think that uh, in this case, uh, uh, let, let, me, let me show our model. So in this case, like uh, this is uh, the, the orange thing is uh, the core, the alpha crystalline domain. And uh, the green thing is uh, the NTD. We think when it's formed this multimer, the NTD is exposed to a solvent. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's from this um, mesh or this 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 like this structure and it can form weak and multivalent interaction with uh, the fields. But when it's perforated, uh, so it disassembled and exposed its uh, uh, alpha crystalline domain. This this uh, client binding motif is exposed. So this motif is more specifically bind to a hydrophobic region of the fields and prevents uh, its amyloid aggregation. So I think this uh, uh, structure disassemble or I mean dynamic assemble can fine tune its chaperon activity and also its uh, domain organization and the ultra structure of HLP 40, uh, 24, which corresponding to its different structure, uh, different function in, I mean, either prevent the aggregation or I mean, to co-face separate and prevent is amyloid fibrillation. Thank you. Mm, thanks, Rand. Uh -huh. I, I have a question, like, it was a very nice talk, actually, I enjoyed your talk. Like, I was wondering, like, between the question, like, uh, I think you briefly mentioned that three days back, there is a nature paper where they have shown that HSP-70 uh, with, like, co chaperone activity, they can actually disaggregate alpha nucleon, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's a paper published uh, yesterday, I think, in Nature, right? Yeah, three days, three days back in Nature from Germany. So I was wondering, like, this kind of concept has been well established in East Prion. Like, they have clearly shown that, like, how the disaggregation in Prion can happen and which can actually in vivo helps in the transfection of the Prion from, uh, the, the, uh, from the sister East to the daughter East, right? So in mm -hmm. case of human, I was wondering like the data that you have shown and uh, correlating to the nature paper. So you have shown that when you start from a monomer and you have the chaperone activity, somehow you ended with the LLPS. And the other paper, they have shown that like when you have fiber, the chaperone can actually cooperatively can disaggregate and form some kind of structure. So I was just wondering like if both the cases happens in vivo in human, so where actually we are ending up, like these kind of molecules and how they degrade in the body, whether it is a LLPS or like fragmented fibers that are created by the chaperones at the end of the day, where they go actually. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's a, that's a great point, I think. Uh, it's, it's a good point. Uh, for the East uh, study, I mean, the pioneer by Susan Linquist, uh, they found that HSP 100, it can disaggregate the fiber, right? I think so it's SP104. Uh, yeah, 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 it's SP104, right? Yeah. So it uh, can disaggregate the fiber. So that's uh, for function, for pre um propagation, right? Right. So that's for a function. So that be, because they need uh, disaggregates. Right. So it's for yeast. But in human, I also, I also argue, in our study, we show that uh, chaperone can prevent uh, fiber formation. And also, in some cases, it, it can promote or prevent the liquid phase transition or, or droplet formation. But we didn't say like HSP 24 or 27 or HSP 40 by itself, it, it, it cannot disaggregate uh, amyloid fibers. And I think that's uh, 
for that, so disaggregate disaggregates its ATP dependence, its need energy to trigger right, right. in vitro. But I also I argue I don't know if that process indeed happened in vivo. I mean, when it's formed, the fiber formed, because that's very important. If you can find a very efficient, I mean, disaggregates disaggregation system, maybe you can just boost that system, which can clear the preformed amino aggregation, right? But in my opinion, I more believe, more believe that uh, when you saw, in some cases, I mean, for HSP-104, I agree that uh, it indeed uh, can, I mean, pull fiber apart by ATP triggered things. But in other case, I think, uh, when you add the chaperone, it can, in some cases, it can disassemble fiber. It's more like uh, the chaperone can stabilize monomeric species or it can redirect the protein in the oligomeric state. Because you know the fiber formation is in equilibrium. If you recruit or you find monomeric uh, species, like you just pull monomer out of the, the fiber, you shift the equilibrium, then the fiber may be spontaneously disassembled, but not directly pulled out by the chaperone. I mean, in some in visual study, I think uh, that phenomenon may be due to that effect, but, uh, and also I thought uh, if, uh, I, I don't know, HSP-104, that's a very strong disaggregation system could uh, indeed occur in vivo or especially in humans system. I, I, I don't think, uh, yeah. Um, but in vitro, there are a lot of studies showing that uh, maybe one chaperone or one molecule di can disassemble preformed fiber. But uh, in my opinion, I think some of them, they just target the monomeric species. When you sequence the monomeric species by chaperone or other small molecule, the fiber can just spontaneously disassemble, shift the membrane. Then you see overall the result is uh, the fiber is disassembled. I, but I, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe in that case, it's just a chaperone right. can right. effectively I think in vitro right. it is understandable and I think already Bena has raised that question, right? Because we don't know the binding affinity between uh, like whatever you have shown HSV40 and your FUS with the binding affinity between HSV40 and HSV70 that could be different. We don't know the binding kinetics between the interaction between two chaperons and the interaction between the selective chaperon and the protein that you are studying. So mm -hmm. in vitro it is understandable like I was just wondering in vivo how these things actually happens and uh, how can we explain that once it form LLPs or it degrade the fiber, the functional state of these proteins and how they recycle in our body? So that is that is what I was wondering. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, all, it's all, always difficult to to study this very complicated uh, chaperoning network in vivo. And yeah. yeah. So so that's uh, that's one very challenging thing. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. I also have a question song for you. Oh, sure, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it was a really interesting talk and it's the, the like all the questions, some of the questions which I had were already answered. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, my question is about a disordered slash uh, structured regions of the proteins and their balance for liquid phase separation because mm -hmm. uh, I see that uh, your study show that uh, both proteins which are structured can go into liquid phase separation but also uh, as you know like uh, FUS and TDP43 there Right. phase separate uh, region, uh, regions which are responsible for phase separation are mm -hmm. the uh, intrinsically disordered. Can you comment mm -hmm. on that? This is kind of more than this global mechanisms of assembly of phase separation. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a great question, Matt. So we, we are also interested in what pattern or what uh, sequence uh, motif uh, may module, uh, mediate phase transition of proteins. And uh, we did a screening. We 
test uh, over 30, 40 different proteins. Some of them are well coded and other are entrenched disorder uh, protein. And we show that in general, entrenched disorder protein exhibits uh, higher pr pr propensity for phase transition in trans order, but uh, well folded protein, they can also undergo phase transition. I mean, the most uh, important uh, factor for mediating phase transition is the multivalency, you know. If the well folded protein, in, uh, last, uh, last month, the paper we published, uh, shape two, is a well folded protein. In the very beginning, we just want to use it as a negative control, you know. We, we thought it's a well folded protein, it shouldn't undergo phase uh, transition. But uh, very surprisingly, when we screen it, it shows very high propensity for phase transition. And when we check into, we look into the structure, feature of this protein, we saw this well folded protein, it has a negative and a positive patch on the surface. I mean, the well-defined multiple positive and negative charge the uh, patch on the surface. So in that case, if it can, has a multiple uh, charge the patch on the surface, it can mediate uh, self-assemble by this uh, multivalent uh, electrostatic interaction. You know what I mean, right? So in that case, uh, well-folded protein can also undergo phase transition very crazily, I mean, rapidly. So, I mean, in general, I mean, in trans disorder protein, it has a relatively higher propensity for mediating phase transition, but for well folded protein or like the protein with multiple repeat domain or multiple uh, uh, motif, it can pre may prevent the multivalent interaction. Then in that case, the protein, well folded protein is also I mean, can crazily form phase transition. So that, that that's uh, my comments on the phase transition propensity. Do you, do you uh, this do you find any um, dependence on the shape of the proteins, like steric hindrance and stuff like that? Uh, uh, because this uh, can be a factor too. Or you you've been just looking at the charges and the sequences. Right, 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 right. Because yeah. it, it really depends. If it's a multi-domain protein, it kind of looks to me to, because it has this hinge, it hinges link right. between the domains, it will be easier to phase separate. So there will be more likely than a one domain protein which will be phase separating. Well, they can still phase separate, but they, it will be more like a kind of uh, more towards crystallinity than the liquid state. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yes. Uh, I, I think the, the, the interplay between multiple domain within one protein is also, I mean, very important for regulating protein phase separation. In one case, we found that uh, uh, the phosphor case, the well folded protein, it has, has three domain. So one domain, well folded domain, responsible for phase transition, but uh, under normal condition, the other two domain just uh, cover the two to block its phase transition interface. But under active uh, condition, it's uh, undergo phase transition, uh, under conformational change, uh, open up its uh, surface, the charged surface, uh, media, the, the protein just rapidly undergo phase transition. So, I mean, the conformational change or interplay between the domain, multiple domain within one protein or between different protein, I think it's also very important in regulation of protein phase transition. And and I, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much what I want to say. And I have another question because we sure. kind of covered, talked a lot about the proteins and chaperones involvement and uh, uh, the, the liquid droplets, uh, they are very complex and all, all of that, but have you thought about a cofactors like um, like sugars or like lipids yeah. as a nucleating, yeah, you, you as a starters for that? Have you tried doing yeah, that? Yeah, you asked a great question actually, yeah. So, so from the very beginning, I showed that we are interested in the protein regulator, right? So like RNA, we will, uh, our one one paper we publish is uh, the. Let's see, let me let me let me find you. This yes, 
So the phase transition regulators, including the chaperone, they, and also we found that RNA is also very important uh, in regulating prone phase transition in granules, uh, because many of the granules, there are uh, RNA, and uh, also very interesting, different type of RNA, it's like a tRNA or mRNA or non-coding RNA, they can just totally uh, exhibit uh, distinct or opposite effect in immediate phase, tran phase transition. Like uh, one type of RNA can induce protein phase transition, the other type of RNA can like uh, inhibit the same protein phase transition. And then the other one, I think is very important, uh, but uh, very limited study was uh, focused on the metabolites. I mean, like uh, the, the things you just mentioned, the small molecule or compounds are metabolized. They, we think uh, they are very important, play an essential role in uh, regulating phase transition. And we are currently working on that to, I mean, to test uh, different uh, protein phase transition, the droplet, if they could uh, observe, uh, 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 observe or, I mean, to find the particular pattern of metabolites and in turn regulate its phase transition. So uh, I think maybe, yeah, I hope maybe next time I can show you more interesting data on identifying metabolites, different metabolites in modulating protein phase transition. But uh, actually for amyloid aggregation, fiber formation, as you know that uh, current, recently there are several amyloid uh, Structure or determined, uh, and it shows from structure. It shows uh, the the density, unknown density. We think is a metabolite or small compound like a par or like heparin or some other less like sugar things. Uh, they may mediate uh, protein fiber formation. I think in that case, we we uh, I, met, uh, I I can tell you that we we just. Uh, uh, determine a uh, cryo yam structure of alpha C nuclein fiber, I mean, in complex with heparin. We show that heparin can crazily prevent alpha C fiber formation and it's mediated. We, we saw how heparin can mediate uh, combined to the fiber, alpha C nuclein fiber surface, the residues, and how it pr promotes the fiber formation. So, in that case, uh, we think um, the sugar or the metabolite. Metabolites can modulate the fiber formation and also the same, they may play a very important role in mediating protein phase transition or liquid liquid phase separation in granule formation. John, so that's, that's, I'm very curious. This is very interesting to, this, to add to the list. Uh, what about metals and lipids? Metal and lipids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's, a, that's also a great question. Particularly uh, metals, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and we actually we 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 studied alpha nuclein, right? And we screen yeah. a lot of different conditions, including lipids, as you mentioned, and uh, ions, different ions, and uh, like crowding the region to see which mm -hmm. if which factor can induce the phase transition of alpha nuclein. And very surprisingly, we saw that the zinc, zinc can promote uh, alpha thin fiber formation and uh, uh, phase transition, droplet formation. And uh, we did an uh, MR experiment showing that things can bind to the C terminal of alpha nuclein. And uh, we are still working on that to see how it puts alpha nuclein together to induce phase transition of alpha nuclein. So we think metal or uh, copper, zinc, or other things, uh, they as long as it can interact with certain area or certain residue of uh, the proteins, they may be important in mediating phase transition. And uh, the lipid things is another thing, is also a very in important thing. Uh, and uh, we are we also interested in, you, you know, on the membrane, lipid can undergo 2D phase transition. It can form this uh, liquid, uh, uh, the micro domain, right? Like, uh, right. So uh, we, we and another thing that we are working on is uh, we are setting up the system to put the uh, membrane protein on the membrane and to induce the 2D phase transition on the membrane. I think in that case, I think the lipids mm -hmm. may play a very important role in mediating or 
regulating the phase transition of protein on the membrane. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for asking. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So, Magda, no, no, go ahead. There is uh, one, one person, Long Cheng is raising his hand. So Bikash, you can let him in. Sure, sure. Uh, Hi. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I just follow the question, previous question about uh, you know the what's RNA role in the stress granule or phase uh, separation. That remind me in 2017, uh, there are two neuron paper talking about TDP43, the phase uh, separation and the fields uh, public neuron and by the UCSD lab. Actually, one paper talking about uh, the TDP43. Actually, they have a demixing maximum actually can form a, a RNA independent uh, uh, lipid uh, separation as different, uh, like parallel to a stretch granule. And at the point, actually, the stress granule and the RNA dependent phase separation is parallel. And uh, the second one, the neuron paper actually they define the compound. Actually, it has the you know fields TDP43 and as RNP, and they found the similar uh, phenotype in the cell. They have the droplet formation, and they have continuity the protein aggregation. Actually, the compound can also to reduce the uh, aggregation. So my question is, uh, do what's your thought? This compound, the, this screen and the defined, do you think will be targeted on the shuffling proteins activity? That's my two questions. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thanks for your, for, for your question. I, I think uh, the first one you think uh, from the neuron paper they show that uh, stress granule is uh, different from the RNA dependent liquid yeah. phase separation of uh, TD43, and they think uh, the RNA dependent uh, phase separation is more associated with uh, the Possible to aggregation of TDP43. Uh, actually, the point is actually uh, this stress granule is uh, toxic, and uh, the RNA dependent uh, phase separation is protective. So in the same cell, actually have a parallel maximum about this. Uh, yeah, separation. Yeah, 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 yeah yes. Uh, stress granules they are enriched in all kinds of different RNA, right? So yeah. RNA is important. Uh, so uh, I think definitely RNA is uh, very important. They maintain the uh, stress granule pro uh, homeostasis. And uh, I think uh, maybe in some cases, uh, RT deficient or this the, uh, imbalance of RNA can induce. In, in my case, I focus on, in this case, I focus on chaperone, right? But in mm. some other studies, it shows that uh, particular RNA in the presence or in the absence of uh, particular RNA, it can, I mean, impair or, I mean, to disrupt the homeostasis of stress granules. So I think, um, yeah. like, uh, in that uh, case, RNA also is, is important, but it, it cannot rule out the importance mm. of chaperone or uh, other things. So, yes. so that's... Uh, okay. mm. Yeah, and the second, uh, the, the, second the compound. Yeah. Oh yes, the, the compound. Yeah. Yeah. The compound. Uh, I I I I didn't. Could you remind me if they identify the target or what well, yeah. was the target of the compound? Or well, they I just screen. The they just identify screen. the target compound. They just uh, screen the compound to look at which compound can reduce the uh, phase separation induced aggregation. I think some. Oh. Yeah, not only reduce the uh, phase separation, also can reduce the continuing the protein aggregation. But I, I don't think they found the target. That's I wondering. Do you have a look at that compound as well? Oh, I didn't. But uh, actually, we are also uh, yeah. doing a high throughput uh, screening assay, trying to find the compound which can fine tune the phase separation or amino aggregation. But uh, actually, there are kind of uh, Tricky. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, like uh, Simon Alberti and others. They 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 published a deposit a bioarchival paper last year showing that uh, they find a compound uh, which can modulate the phase transition of stress granule, and uh, that it could 
maybe potentially as a, I mean, the drug candidate uh, to treat uh, ARS or some other disease. But I think uh, there are, you know, there, so far there is no specific uh, molecule which can, you know, because of this transition, they're just widely observed or occurred in cells. So yeah. if you have a small molecule, or something you you can alter the phase transition of protein. I think maybe it's only if it's very specific to the particular, like to interact yeah. with the fields. It may has a very limited yeah. side effect. But actually, for phase transition, the key factor or key uh, feature is uh, weak multivalent interaction. So yeah. the interaction mediating phase transition is not that specific. It's mm -hmm. like the multiple weak interactions. So that's uh, make uh, it very difficult to develop a very specific, very efficient uh, small molecule targeting particular Definitely. proteins. So in my opinion, when you screen, you find some molecule, it may have widely I mean, why the effect uh, in influencing different uh, protein phase transitions? So in your case, uh, maybe ex in, uh, under extreme condition, it can disrupt the yeah. uh, amyloid aggregation and uh, phase transition of stress granule, but uh, it may also, I mean, yeah. alter the phase transition of other granules or other gotcha. proteins. So I'm still gotcha. caution about uh, the small yeah. molecule development, but for the Fiber formation, I mean, so inhibitor against the fiber formation, I think that's uh, maybe more promising because like mm -hmm. uh, now we know more and more cryo-EM and the uh, MR structure of fiber, right? Yeah. Pathological fibers. The fibers uh, structure are, are more ordered, high ordered, and it has a particular structure. So in that case, it gives you room or space for developing Specific inhibitor, or I mean, the tar uh, mm. molecule target. Right? Mm, what, what, in yeah. liquid liquid phase separation, it's just yeah. like the mass, like the black yeah. box. Every, everyone knows there's multiple weak interactions, and it's yeah. non specific. That's the main yeah. feature of the. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the power, probably future, we can discuss the future some collaboration because we have a lot of pathological uh, fraction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have disease. Maybe we can look into the modification or other PTM happen to different uh, uh, protein in different disease backgrounds. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah, that's a very important point. Yeah, we wish to yeah. keep in touch and discuss. Okay, it. okay. Thank you so much. Sure, sure, sure. Hey, Tong. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mata, yeah. Yeah, Rob, yeah. you go ahead. Yeah, no, I, we are done. This is an excellent talk and uh, great Thanks, discussion. Rob. So thank you very much, Chong. It must be too early morning for you. One o'clock? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I got coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chong. Yeah, it was Thanks, nice. Thanks, yeah, it was... And thanks, Rams, for thank, the it's, it's Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic work and really yeah, yeah very nice. I, I look forward to I mean to meeting you. I mean it's it's it's, it's such a pity that uh, we couldn't uh, meet uh, in Italy this year. But I think uh, the the COVID nineteen yeah. should. Uh, but we are getting used to the new normalcy that we are able to meet a lot of people. For example, you you are able to meet a lot of people here. So. Yeah. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah. So there are sure. some good things as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, great, great. So oh, thank you very much. I will take leave from you and Magda. You want you did not. So say. yeah, I was. I just <laughs> want to send send my uh, hi uh, to uh, Dan. So hopefully, mm. I'll, yeah. yeah, I just um, uh, I'll try to drop her an email. I I don't. I actually don't have her email. If you can send it to me, it will be yeah, really sure, great. Yeah, sure, sure. We, we